Friends. Welcome. Dude. Phil Smith. Ah. Oh. I could just listen to this guy talk. We literally finished each other's sentences, you know that, right? That's, that was like, we're, just, we're two parts of a barbershop quartet at this point. Uh, yeah, no, Phil is, and I think we've all agreed, and the people have agreed unanimously that he's going to be a standing fixture of RX Radio. But big announcement. Yeah. Standing fixture of the Prescript team. I love it. Yo. An asset. Uh, first line center. It's a hockey reference. Um, but no, man, like to, to bolster the nutrition arm of prescript education, um, you know, we obviously have Dr. Dwayne Jackson uh, teaching prescript nutrition as it pertains to body composition. Mm -hmm. And I think the other main vein of nutrition education always, or at least in our opinion, as far as it complements our applied biomechanics, functional anatomy, we're always about performance, right? Mm -hmm. So Phil Smith will be teaching an ongoing class, ongoing in the sense that we're gonna run semester after semester after semester. So um, the inaugural semester of prescript nutrition, sports performance nutrition. Um, and if you guys have heard Phil before, you'll know what a great orator is, what a great teacher, these, his ability to speak in uh, analogy and metaphor and take very complex things Bring it down. And here's the key. And this is what I pride ourselves in, the brand, Prescript, on the whole, is it's one thing to take advanced concepts and bring them down to a level people understand. It's another thing entirely to be able to take advanced concepts, bring it down to a, people level under, a level of understanding that most people can grasp, and then bring them back up to the advanced concepts. Right. That's Phil Smith. Yeah. So... You're very excited, guys. Registration's live on the website. There's payment plans. Barrier of entry to this is financially very low. The amount of value you're going to get for this course, if you're someone that aspires to improving performance with nutritional intervention, habitual intervention, habits, sleep, hydration, this course goes, and again, like most things, whenever we're looking at curriculum, it's always actionable, right? There's very, not that there's minimal theory, but theory is always tied to action, and that's real education as far as we're concerned. Um, and if you're uncertain, listen to all the Phil pod, Phil's podcasts that he's done with us just to get a taste of what he does off the cuff. Right. having to deal with me and you just blah, 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 like <laughs> rapid fire. topics at him, yeah. Right, and this episode is no different. We actually start to talk about some of the principles of improving performance with nutritional intervention in today's episode. Such a fan of this dude. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, there's another thing to teach the theoretical and teach it in a way that brings high-level concepts down to an end user and another thing entirely to bring it back up. But it's another thing entirely to teach it from a place of knowing how to apply it and having applied it yourself. So true. I use the first line center hockey reference. Phil's really like the O lineman when we're talking about physics. He is uh, by and large, far and away, the largest member of the prescript staff. Huge. 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 Huge with a U or what I, I think it would be a H Y. H Y Q. Huge. I, I taught him the Newfieism. So huge. 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 In Newfoundland, if your name starts with an H, they don't say the H. But if your name starts with an E, they say an H. So I have an uncle Head, but it's Ed. And I have a neighbor named Hubert, but it's Hubert. Little fun fact for the dinner table. All <laughs> that, all Newfieisms aside, Phil Smith, uh, nutrition for sports performance. Mm -hmm. And I think if, regardless of the level of athlete or client you're training, if you want to get the most out of your training, t treating your clients like athletes and having performance be the one thing that we look to drive, that is a vein, again, that runs through all of our education from the applied biomechanics, functional anatomy, to upcoming courses, spoiler alert, our programming course, something we were talking about the other day, using performance, tangible metrics to make decisions, data-driven decisions. Phil Smith, heater. Hope you guys enjoy. Um, if you have any questions for Phil, you can reach out to him on Instagram. You can access him through the info at pre scriptcom I believe he has a webinar coming up, if I'm not mistaken. So do keep an eye out in the coming weeks for his webinar, um, just to get a just to get a guided flavor of what it is he brings to the table, how he delivers content. So special. 
Um, that's all I got. Yeah. Anything to add? Uh, Phil is just that figure that you don't want to disappoint. Exactly. The he's way that he speaks, it's just like, okay, I'll do it because you said that I should do it. Straight and to the brow line. I know. I know. Sergeant so Phil Smith. For this guy, so you guys are going to love the podcast. Um, I highly recommend his course. There's so much to learn from him. Lundy, hit it. You're tuned in to RX Radio. In the last three days, yeah, this is about as good as it gets. Yeah. I like. <laughs> I took pre-workout and barely trained just to have energy to be alive for our boy Phil here. I went the other way and just slept Monster on the couch. Energy drink. In the Star Wars cup. <laughs> I had a... Everything. I had 10 shots of espresso, a scoop of that pre-workout, and a rain energy drink. In a day. And I yawned. Uh, In a day, in three that's hours. An what? That's an issue. See, you guys are both caffeine abusers way worse than I am. I'm sure I'm Phil's wild. Opinion, that's wrong. It's quite, it's quite funny, actually. I went, to, I went to a cafe the other day with some friends, and I ordered a, a, a quad shot latte on skim milk, and... Um, He's no, 140 away, kilos, dog. Don't look at me like that. <laughs> the the barista actually come over to the cashier and said, and my friend happened to be behind me in line, said, um, is this order correct? And my friend just goes, yeah, that's correct. Yeah. yeah. That's, 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 what he that's like me when I order sushi at a restaurant. Just like, you know, it's yeah. two pieces per, like, yeah, 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 whole table's like, yeah, yeah, no, he knows. He does this all the time. <laughs> it's like when I get the flat white and I go four extra shots and they're like, you know, it comes with two. And I'm like, bitch, I yeah. do this every day. <laughs> <laughs> you know I'm insane. Give me the fucking apron. I'll do it my goddamn self. Well, that kind of brings up a good point, right? Because one of the things that I, I was heavily influenced my early days of training and nutrition around Charles Poliquin. And Poliquin was a performance above all else coach. And like you hear stories later in his life about what he got up to with drugs and professional sports, like when at all costs was this guy's mantra. And one of the things I remember seeing was prescriptions of a gram of caffeine, like pre-workout. It was a, a milligram per kilogram of body weight. But if you were over a hundred kilos, like you were looking at a very, very hefty dose. And he's like, yeah, no, this isn't for health. This is for glory. Like make a choice. Any any input on that? Like, what what is the what is the prevailing thought process on stimulants in general, and more specifically, yeah. caffeine? Well, to be honest, the only real sort of stimulant you're going to use that's globally accepted is the caffeine conversation. I mean, the old and like he's not he's not that far off. You talk about like the av- the average athletic population; they're not 72 kilos for a lot of the the performance or, or power based athletes. So the old days, we used to actually think a lot around you know the eight nine milligrams per kilo of body weight. These days, it's been <laughs> round white, white white down down to about sort of about three milligrams to four milligrams per kilo of body weight. But if you can get an efficacious dose for you personally at one or two, please stick with that. I mean, minimum effective dosing is probably where it's at. But yeah, like personally, I like to sort of sit between three and five, depending on the person. But I mean, if you take in like, I'd be looking at at nine, like what's that? 1. 1.2 grams. Oh. If I took in, you know, nine milligrams per kilo of body weight, that's ridiculous. So how do you know when it's too much? You, yeah, because there's got to no. be you got to drop off, right? There's, it has to be a decrease in performance. Yeah, so so these days we sort of we sort of say that anything above six milligrams per kilo is going to be like there's going to be no additional benefit to that. Mm-hmm. So if if a person's consuming, I'm not saying if you are a person with a high tolerance as myself or Killian or yourself, Junta, like with that in mind, you're not doing it for performance benefit. You're doing it for other reasons but from a from a ergogenic True. benefit anything above six milligrams per kilo is pretty much the limitation these days and would that be something you would take in like an acute bout like hey i'm gonna take this in a powder form pre-contest or pre-training or is that a tolerance that you would accumulate throughout the day of training or competition no you'd be done in acute dosage so caffeine has an efficacious dosage of about 60 minutes so the conversation of you know this goes back to the old the old dry scooping of pre-workout before you train it sort of makes no sense from 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 even from a timing point i mean there's other factors why it makes no sense but even from the way caffeine actually works in the body it, it really needs that 45 to 60 minutes and there are fast metabolizers and slow metabolizers of caffeine but for, for most part it's five to six hours is is the actual duration of the caffeine um sort of metabolism in time but in saying that though if you're going to talk about it from a performance benefit it's yeah 60 minutes prior to the event if there's a if there's a long duration let's say a marathon or some sort of endurance based event you may have a very small dosage throughout the event 
paired with uh paired with carbohydrates because there is some discussion around the ability to to restore glycogen or just benefit the output with carbohydrate intake when caffeine is paired but it's it's like one or two studies which have suggested that now is it something where when you take that much caffeine the source matters because i know people say like oh this is a patented caffeine that's natural versus synthetic, like coffee versus caffeine pills. Does that change like how we look at that, you know, that 60 minute window of like, you know, pre-contest dosing as well as that five to six hour uh, period or window that the caffeine stays active? Does, does the source matter? Yeah, it does. So, so there's, there is a fairly substantial argument these days that caffeine anhydrous or synthetic caffeine. So anhydrous means without water and meaning without anhydrous meaning water. It's more or less synthetic dehydrated caffeine. That's going to be your best option. Um, but, but there are some other, there's some other papers that sort of suggest that it doesn't really matter that much for the average person. But I would always lean towards a caffeine anhydrous source, whether it be a gum, it could be a powder, it could be an energy drink, for example, in some cases. But there are people who preach the coffee route. Coffee contains natural, um, you know, things like uh, like theanine that naturally exists, which decrease the actual uh, the eff- efficacious dosage or also the stimulatory dosage or, or anti fatigue aspect of caffeine. So I would always push people towards that in hydro source from like a performance standpoint. From a perf- yeah, yeah, from a performance standpoint, yeah. And I like that there's a differentiation there. Yeah. Right? One thing, like to what Phil said, and like Phil, you can tell me I'm wrong here. Uh, but like you had said, like in longer duration events, like one thing I do with more more competitive powerlifters usually because the events are longer, the flights are larger, is I would recommend like yourself, like I recommend caffeine pills more because of a controlled ability to to deploy that caffeine itself. Like this person's not going to take in or not take in that amount of caffeine or that dosage. I'm able to kind of control the the input of that caffeine on the athlete. So 60 minutes before squat at the end of squat preparing for the bench, at the end of bench preparing for the deadlift. And it's not like they're taking 1.6 grams at the beginning of squat and then they're crashing before the deadlift or they're drinking half a cup of coffee, feeling dehydrated because they also cut weight and then just tossing the coffee in the garbage. I would 100% agree, man. So, so a control, a controlled dosage is, is where it's at, and like it could be, for example, a caffeine tablet is a good yeah. example of that. You know, um, uh, to be honest with you, an energy drink is the same. You know, like there's a uh, the the former world champion pole vaulter Steve Hooker, Australian guy, or world champion Courtney Atkinson. He's a he's a triathlete or Ironman as you want to call it these days. They they literally they literally use Red Bull, and the reason why they use Red Bull is because. 80 milligrams of caffeine every single 250 mils of can it's exactly the same yeah. steve hawker doesn't need as much energy as courtney atkinson does so he uses one sugar-free option and one full strength option whereas courtney atkinson uses two cans and the reason why two cans equates to 160 milligrams these guys are slight guys he's only 70 kilos or roughly so that's a way you can get it guaranteed every single dosage we have a product called no dose over here which is the caffeine tablets you get the extra strength which are 200 milligrams or the single strength which is 100 milligrams but it's guaranteed every single time with coffee i liken it as i say grapes in wine the 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 root needs to be stressed it needs to be have a certain amount of rainfall where it's from the slope of the ground the gradient at the center of the sun all these things are going to change the way the coffee flavors but also the way the caffeine's actually taken up into the bean itself even though the brewing process right there's like long shot Um, ristretto if you're getting a latte where you get it from blonde roast versus medium roast and and how that affects it right i just think coffee is such a silly way of doing it i'm not that fancy that was just... impressive i was waiting for like a hipster mustache to grow and him to spell my name wrong that, that's experience you know what you lived in parkdale for yeah, too I've long in you've been in brooklyn long, yeah you're the, you're the bk fucking barista rant well the one thing too just from a performance standpoint i don't know about you uh when i drink coffee i take a shit could you imagine being four quadrettos deep or whatever the hell you drink i can't i can't i'll can. tell you it's not yeah. good for performance i call it every day of my life and that's yeah. something too like you know there might be you know muted benefits to the the caffeine or the stimulatory effect with the, the presence of theanine and natural sources and but it, like that clearly puts a stake in the road it's like are you here to perform we're here to be healthy yeah because like we can mitigate risk but like i would imagine those who are looking to be world class or looking to perform we we need to accept risk at a certain point and stop mitigating it because if it's for health then in high performance isn't for you correct me if i'm wrong but like at some point the mitigation of risk has to give way to the acceptance of risk when it comes to high performance 
Yeah, I mean, like, and you and I have talked about this before, Jordan. Like, it's it's before, high performance isn't isn't health. They you, you need to have the foundations. You can't build a house on sand, right? So health comes first, but you need to then ensure that there's a separation or, or some sort of like fork in the road where you do go listen. All right, health was health was looked after. The, the, those those foundations of the house have been built. Now it's time to veer right. And an, an easy example that's saying with a caffeine conversation, the World Health Organization recommend no more than two hundred fifty to four hundred milligrams of caffeine a day. Just on the on the calculations that we just talked about, we're exceeding that by double, two, three times in some cases. So, what's good for Jenny from the suburbs is not always good for the athlete on the pitch. Yeah, and I think like even to speak to that myself, like the performance versus health. Like we just did our intensive here last weekend, and uh, I was talking to a few guys about my experience with bobsleigh, and like mm-hmm. I survived bobsleigh by taking a gram and a half of caffeine a night, uh, not taking thirty two milligrams of ephedrine taking a gram of ibuprofen and you know as much gravel as i could handle it just being a zombie right and but i think like you had mentioned like health has to be there and performance there's a deviation in the road but performance is more often than not an acute period of time in a lifespan yes. i think highest yes. performance right like mm-hmm. even if you play 10 years in you know uh, the nba or something against your lifespan of maybe you know 70 that's still an acute period of that time to be high performance yeah, I mean, and moving away from caffeine, you can you can move this conversation into things like fiber. We know the benefits of fiber, lowers blood glucose, controls blood pressure, all of the benefits, reduces things like colorectal cancers. In a high performance athlete, you're, if you're giving them, if this person has a high energy need, for example, so let's say 4,000 calories and above, if you go off the, the World Health Organization's recommendation of 18 grams per thousand calories, this person's ingesting 80 grams of fiber a day. Now, what person at high output is going to not shit themselves at that much fiber yeah. with adequate intake, you know? So the the, the conversation is going to be lowered down to 13 grams per thousand calories. But then also, once you hit 45, just cut it. Because as Killian, as you just said, man, there's, there's, the reality is you're not going to have a person who's high performance, I mean, except for Tom Brady, of course, who's going to exceed 10 years. Yeah. You know, the reality is it's a snapshot in their life. So do what you can to mitigate any risk factors to their health and then control the workings outside of that. So, for example, when the days they're not competing on a rest day, you may run higher fiber. You, you may control at a slightly higher control or you may say, listen, all right, this person's in off season now. They may bring a small amount of rest. Let's let's use the example the NFL guys are in, you know, preseason non mandatories at the moment, so they can run a higher level of fiber now. But coming July, as soon as July, August, you really have to drop that fiber down and control it for, for balance. If you had to rank order from like a performance standpoint, because like I think nutrition on health is great. Obviously, like we don't want to shit on that. I think health is like a very safe touch point for this conversation to demonize a lot of practices that come up in the industry like you know research-based phds with instagram accounts and we're not going to name names or handles or anything like that and i think they probably have the public's best interest in mind but they they operate from a very safe place it's like oh i'm gonna i'm gonna demonize some of these practices for body composition or whatever under the flag of hey everyone should be healthy I rarely see anyone sticking their neck out and talking about, all right, hey, let's respect health as a starting point. Let's mitigate risk from a health standpoint. But hey, once we've done all that, it's fourth and long. We're going to punch into the red zone. We're going to try and win this bitch. Like, what are the things that if you were to rank order the most important nutritional interventions, whether that's calories, whether that's, I mean, sleep, whether it's supplementation, if you had your go-to, like, all right, we're going to try and check these boxes to maximize acute bouts of performances, what, it, like, what does that list consist of? Uh, total, total intakes first. Uh, energy provisions, obviously. So total intake is, is, has subcategories underneath it. For example, things like adequate protein for recovery and repair. We have adequate hydration, obviously, there, and adequate adequate fuel for the for the, the source of carbohydrates, or for that matter, fat if it's a low intensity sport. Second is definitely sleep, and then third would actually be separate to nutrition. It would be recovery periods in between bouts. So that's the, the probably the three factors there. But as I said before, even though it's I put them under the term of energy intake. I'm sort of separating that into subcategories of, you know, hydration, repair, recovery, things like that. So, so definitely. And then obviously second, that is definitely sleep. Um, I think hydration and sleep are the two things that we're just not talking about enough with athletes. But when we dig into like supplementation, we just talked about caffeine. Mm -hmm. There's like a million and one tricks that athletes will use, whether it be old school, like, 
you know, you talked about gravel, probably because Ambien was hard to get a hold yeah. of, right? Like it said in the major leagues, like Major League Baseball runs off alcohol, Ambien, and Adderall, right? Like what, and not that like you're condoning these practices, but what are athletes getting up to to get these acute spikes of performance with way more drastic implications on health? Drugs. Like <laughs> okay, but like so. For example, one of the craziest things I've ever heard, and you might—I think everyone in this room might know who this is. I don't want to out him. I remember a power lifter. Mind you, this matters, right? In my mind, if you're going to mitigate, or if you're going to accept the risk of your health for performance, you, you okay? Secure the bag, dog. You know what I mean? Like, get <laughs> fucking paid. There was. It was said. Now I wasn't there. But it's been said that someone before a third attempt deadlift took a fucking EpiPen. <laughs> like Jason Statham in cranked shit. Oh, that, that, I've, that I've never heard of. But that's, yeah, that would technically work. I mean, in, in, a, in a short sense. <laughs> I hope they had an EMT on the team on the back end of the third deadlift. But I mean, like, yeah, it technically worked. I've never heard of stuff like that before. But I'm also not dealing with that, that level. I mean... You know, I used to have a coach back in the day. If we ever strained or tore a muscle, do you guys know what DSMO is? Mm -hmm. It's what they put on horses. Yeah, 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 yeah. they the put races. it through yeah. like yeah. electrophoresis like a or whatever. Gel or whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so if you ever hurt, yeah. I so I used to I used to paint myself with Finergan before I squatted. Um, I've actually got a torn a torn left hip. I still have it to this day. But if I ever went over his house and he saw me doing it, he would pull out the DSMO and goes, "Just rub this down your sweet." And you, as soon as you put it on your skin, you get an instant taste of metal in your mouth. Yeah, because mm, it's be it's a it's a, it's a metal breakdown. So I mean, like things like that. But I've never heard of epipens before. But I mean, yes, technically, as long as the EMTs on, you know, on site, I don't don't say it wouldn't grow, it wouldn't work. Your friends don't try hard enough to cheat if that's the case. Yeah, because <laughs> <laughs> no. I, I mean, I used to play hockey with kids with um, maybe this isn't performance enhancing drug, but like I know kids that hand to God between periods in a hockey game would come out of the bathroom and just bump keys of Coke. Yeah. Like performance enhancement outside of like sports performance. Cause those are two different conversations, yes. right? Sports performance is like, how do we, how do we manipulate, you know, the rules? How do we you understand physiology within the rules where sports performance is like, anyone got an eight ball? I think it really <laughs> go for just a hoot between periods. Yeah. Yeah, I just knew a bunch of guys that used to that used to literally train legs on coke. I, I, I knew those guys back in the day. They were um, they were a bit next level. But I mean, just keep in mind as well, like the, the clientele I'm working with, people aren't hiring me if they're that mentality. Right. Because that's not you know the, these guys are the Twinkies and Coke Coke cans before they they train type clients. Whereas people who want to work with me want to optimize that that foundational aspect of their health first, and then move their performance further. They're not looking for the shortcuts via the way of donuts and sandwiches before they train. Right, but the that brings up the point of like the psychological aspect of it, right? Because yeah. that's yeah. why I mean I've heard you say before, Killing is like just give me blue water before yeah. I train. It doesn't matter if there's caffeine or anything in it, but there's like just, the yeah. placebo effect, hundred percent of just like toilet having. Water. That's what it is for me for like. Even cognitive performance, we'll yeah. put in quotes, is like, I just feel like I need a cup of coffee in the morning before I want to see anyone's face first off, but for me to actually think and be productive. So what side, yeah. where does this stuff play into to the mental benefit or the placebo benefit? Oh, that's it's benefit? huge. And the big thing with, with strength athletes is BCAAs. So using <laughs> using them. or using a, some sort of flavored glucose, for example, yeah, if they come un, yeah. come underneath you and they and you know they're talking about oh my amino acids or whatever supplement they want to use, which happens to be bright blue because what the fuck is a blue raspberry? Um, <laughs> you know all of these things. That's the truth, right? They they'll say like oh, I need my BCAs. What for? And you try and explain it to them, but they're bought they've bought into that premise because their sixteen year old sub shop sold sold them to them. You know, like mm -hmm. that's how you need to go. Right? Listen, it's not doing them any harm. If it's creating psychological buy-in, start them there and then phase them out of it over time. It's no different to people, you know, you see those powerlifters who foam roll for 45 minutes before they lift anything. Yeah. It's like, dude, my session's done. Yeah. And you're still on the, on your ass rolling on a piece of foam. Well, Matt Nichol told us a really funny story. Matt Nichol is a strength coach here uh, in the greater Toronto area. And he works, not exclusively, but he's very famous in the NHL. And he worked for the Toronto Maple Leafs back in like their heyday in early yeah. 2000s. And he worked with a goalie, Eddie the Eagle Balfour. 
infamous in the NHL. And he told us a story that there was a specific type of orange juice yeah. that you can only buy at Whole Foods. And they were in the playoffs against Ottawa. Very like tense series, you know, provincial rivals, you know, four hour drive up the road, five hour drive up the road. And uh, Eddie needed to have his like sunny time orange juice that you can only get at Whole Foods. And he, they were going on like a four day road swing and the other players got into the fridge and started drinking it. So he had to ration it and he went over and got like a minute made from the other dressing room on an away game and then like gave it to Eddie before like going into overtime and he tasted it. It was like, what the fuck did you do to my orange juice? And he like took off down and like Matt was like, I'm out of here, man. This is fucking insane. I'm a strike coach, not an orange juice dealer. <laughs> but it kind of comes down to like, you know, psychology trumps physiology. A hundred percent. Well, that's for me. Like I, I'm very habitual in nature. I wouldn't say like I'm obsessive, but not compulsive in a way. Like this is unrelated to, to working out, but it relates back to what you said about me needing to drink blue water. Like if I go to the movies ever since I was a kid, I went to the movies with my dad, we'd get diet Coke and a bag of Twizzlers or nibs or whatever, red vines, whatever. And we would always get this. And if I go to the movie theater today and I don't get that and I sit down in the theater, I will start to physically sweat. Like I become agitated. I start to actually sweat. Like I get really like, distracted and I have to go back out and buy it. And that's the same thing with my workout. Like I chugged like another gram and a half of caffeine before I worked out today because every time I train, I'm like, I put something in a shaker cup or, and shake it up and I drink it. Yeah. Um, and for a while, like to try and, you know, lower my dose of caffeine, I was just getting Mio. Yeah. And I would just put like water flavor, like flavored, like blue flavored water in the water bottle, shake it up and drink it. And I didn't notice a difference in performance. Cordial for our Australian audience. Yeah. Squash. Yeah. So my, my, my partner, Shay, she uses beta alanine because that's all she wants. She just wants yeah. the paresthesia. Right. What? Yeah, the caffeine, the caffeine's, irre- yeah, the caffeine's no. irrelevant to her. So I, she I, wants I her face that. to melt off? Dude, get rid all of she, it. Like, keep in mind, like, she'll take pre-workout at 10 a.m. and go for a run at 1.30 you know, it's it's not it's not benefiting her at all in the slightest, but she likes the aspect that paresthesia has kicked in. That's what she wants. I love that. Like I used to, uh, I couldn't take any more caffeine in the day. Like when I was training for for bobsleigh because I was sprinting and I was lifting in the weight room. So when I would get to the gym to lift in the weight room, I wouldn't take pre workout, but I would rub Tiger Balm <laughs> all over my legs. This is true. I'd rub. I'd be in the change room of a Good Life Fitness, and I would rub Tiger Balm or a five, three, five extra strength all over my legs. And then I'd pull on like dry fit tights, like virus tights and go train. Does anyone else it was think just this the guy's... Paris, like of the heat and the itch. He just smelled like dude, my grandpa. Dude, yeah, dude. dude. <laughs> he's Ben Affleck in the account. We're just going to come in when he's just going to be fucking his shins with a rolling pin. Listen to like ride the lightning or something. Just got to feel something. Yeah, but I totally Jeez. get that. I, I get like that idea. It was just like that tactile sensation. I was like, oh, I'm ready to go. I can squat now. What are the craziest yeah. habits you've seen, whether nutrition or otherwise, to improve performance? Not, not a lot, nothing crazy to be honest. Like just things like, just things like sleep. Um, you know, people, I know people who have sleeps before they train every single day before they train, they'll have a sleep. I know one guy that has to walk 6,000 steps. He walks exactly 6,000 steps and then he'll train. If he's at 4,897, he will walk another 1,003 steps before he trains. Just little things like that. Little just, things? Just little, well, That's they're little mentality aspects. <laughs> That's <is> crazy. <laughs> Just, just there's little practices that people put in play, you know, um, before they before they step foot in whatever event or performance or training academy they want to walk into, and it's just, you know, I, I get it, I get it. It sets them up, whether it be uh, the whole getting sunshine in the morning on the face thing, or you know, sunshine in the asshole, or whatever the cool kids are doing these days. Like, <laughs> haven't you seen that? Yeah, I've heard, I, yeah, yeah. No, I heard, it was, I heard it was ball sack. I'll do something on the balls, yeah. but like stay away oh God, from now, fucking can, neighbors. Now, does that work, Phil? Like being from Australia, <laughs> there's enough assholes full of sunlight there. Like what? Does it work? I've never tried to kill him, but please oh, let us know. Could you, you imagine <laughs> being like a, like a skin cancer surgeon? You're just cutting scrotums all day? <laughs> Fuck that. Yeah. I remember like yeah. poliquin, like you said, like a poliquinism. Like how many I use of vitamin D that I have to eat you to were never the sun. grow? Yeah. You were the sun. 27,000 I use of vitamin you D You just glow something? in the dark. You just turn the I never lights noticed off. the difference. No, God, no. I remember noticed the difference in my bank account. I'm <laughs> still upset. Yeah, no, it's ridiculous. <laughs> 
I twenty seven thousand IU. My ex wife slid bobsled for or sorry skeleton yeah. for the Australian Olympic team, and we mm-hmm. were in what we graduated two thousand fifteen, so it would have been two thousand thirteen. I was outside a start house uh, on the side of a hill. You know what a start house is in Salt Lake City, you know Park City, Utah, Park, yeah. at the uh, the Olympic Oval or whatever it is there, and she comes out of the room of the start house with uh, an ampule all in Russian. <laughs> and she's like, and she knows my proclivity for certain things. And she goes, do you know what this is? Females were running what I'm to understand to be like suspended testosterone prior to pushing a sled for four seconds. That makes a lot of sense. She, I think she originally placed 11th, 11th in the 2010 Vancouver Olympic Games and retroactively since banning B stu- uh, drug tests, she's now recorded as sixth <laughs> because year over year they keep popping retroactive yeah. Russian, uh, Russian drugs or uh, Russian athletes for drugs. They're using test suspension before they run. Mm. Yeah, just like in the old country, man. Putin told them to do it. And just that's that's super interesting, isn't it? Like, just no S surges in there, done. Well, do you remember the Vander Holyfield? The Vander Holyfield. It said that Evander Holyfield, when he fought Mike Tyson, uh, took an ingested a substance called check drops, check drops yeah, which are for uh, dogs female in dogs heat. in heat. Have, oh, you, so have I, you not heard this? I have a good check drop story, even better than every, the Evander Holyfield. Every story is a good check drop story. <laughs> oh wait, is this the powerlifting meet? <laughs> yeah. Okay, go. So I was at a at a at a local powerlifting meet, of course, in a hotel, you know, <laughs> convention hall. Yep. And uh, in Mississauga by the airport, um, and there's a dude there who had just almost cut his hand in half a few months prior, and was competing, and he didn't really care what he deadlifted. They were gonna let him use a strap, just like he was a friend of everybody, and he didn't care about his total, but he had almost just cut his hand. And he took a bunch of check drops. Now he squatted high on his opener. He got two red lights, squatted high on his second attempt, got two red lights, squats high on the third attempt, starts to yell at the judge, and the judge looks at him and goes like, listen, man, we told you two attempts ago it was high. Proceeds to backhand slap the judge and go into the back. But, I mean, if our individual here is on check drops, we can assume the judge might be, you know, doing some extracurricular activity as well. I'm spotting and loading. There's a big ruckus. I go into the warm-up room, and now the judge is back there choking out the check drop guy in the warm-up room, like holding a 120-kilo man against the wall by his throat, like threatening him, and this guy's on check drops, and then he proceeded to just take a nap. I think the lesson here is trend beats check drops. I think that's what I, that's what I heard. <laughs> judge, I heard judge on trend, got lifter on check drops. Yeah. Tr- trend wins that in straight sets. Yeah, that's I how the so. match goes. Well, I man, you want to talk crazy performance enhancement far outside of any sort of professional. I have personally, and this is, I have personally injected someone, and I'm not going to say who, with nine mils of test suspension in the morning of a, of a powerlifting meet. I sat there and loaded the dart and jabbed the shoulder with nine mils of test suspension. Just one dart? Two darts. Okay. The thing is, they're three mil darts, but if you believe, you can actually fit like four and a half. Oh, yeah. And this is like, we're talking, you know, we're not talking about mitigating or accepting risk. We're talking about, oh, let's see if we can end our own lives here. Thoughts? My theory is just like, I'm glad you did it in the shoulder and not into the glutes. How would they even get into position for squatting with that much shit in their back? Like, that's, that's just an be insane a amount of spring. Fluid. Yeah, it was a lot. I mean, he's a big boy. He had some real estate. Yeah. Yeah, thoughts not not solid. Like, no, probably probably performance wise, probably had a lot of aggression sitting there. But I can't see, I can't see it being a long term game change, game game plan. So when it comes to like beginning a uh, non nine mil protocol for improving sp- like performance in sport, <laughs> obviously the energy system is probably going to be the predetermining factor. I would imagine, right? Like assessment yeah. of the sport itself is going to dictate where we try to begin to meet the athlete where they're at and take them to where they want to go. Like walk a little bit through the process of, okay, someone comes to you and you, you identify the sport, you identify like maybe a chronological or training age, you identify mm-hmm. a current state. What are like the, how, what is the process of manipulating nutrition, supplementation? Like, do you, do you titrate things in? Is it a massive overhaul? Like, walk us through kind of the process or the thought process behind 
improving someone's nutrition for sports performance? Yeah, a lot of it, a lot of it is is uh, to be honest, a lot a lot of the first stage is 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 probably informing the client where they actually sit for output. So a lot of them have a huge misunderstanding about where they sit. And the example is they, you know, and even higher level athletes tend to use things like the calories on an Apple Watch or a Fitbit or something like that. And you've got to explain, hey, listen, that's not accurate by any means. It's about 45% out in most cases. And use those, I mean, just a, a deep, small deviation, use those calories more of an intensity gauge as opposed to an accurate reading actually on how many calories you exert. But identifying those conversations and then from there, building off what they're already doing. So don't go in and change the entire game unless they're just eating like a 10-year-old a credit card, for example, then you change everything. But if, if, you, if they have the foundations in play, a lot of it's things like little to no vegetables or fruits. So then you start to explain, all right, well, giving someone a Ferrari full of fuel but no key to start the engine is a waste of time. So we bring in that key by giving them fruits and vegetables. And it's quite simply just small swap of you don't need to have 500 grams of, of rice here and there. You can actually just have say 200 grams with a piece with an apple with two apples, for example, and start to build in nutrition that way. But the big one is, is what I call phase one is simply just sticking to very similar what they're already doing and making small habitual changes. So if you guys are familiar, who are familiar with BJ Fogg, you can use things like the the ABC method. So an anchor behavior and a, and a celebration, you attach a new behavior to an existing anchor, and then you make a small celebration after the fact. So it's not about going, listen, I'm going to rewrite your entire world, make small changes that will come, but it will come with habit formation over time. Does that help? <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's yeah. you. Sorry. I thought there was a lag in the camera for a second. I was just like, is he frozen? Uh, no, 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 no. So, so that, that's that's phase one, and then from there, a lot of the conversations goes into into how we can then extend how in, how nutrition can influence other factors. For example, nutrition and how it influences sleep. For example, nutrition and how it influences your recovery and your and your your just exertion windows. So, do they need carbohydrates in, during their training, or are they doing that because? Their, their coach who trained them for 45 minutes read that carbs are beneficial within a 45-minute workout, when, when, when reality is, in most cases, they're not. Will this person benefit, for example, a fighter who are trying to create um, what's called mitochondrial biogenesis? Would they benefit from periods of low-energy state training, for example? Would we go for a run for 5Ks or 10Ks, as long as they're doing it in less than one-hour windows, if we go in a in a depleted state, will there be some sort of physiological benefit to that? So we have to look plan it, you know, and plan in accordance with their intensity, their training, their structure, and their frequency of duration. But then also look at, you know, where does this person currently sit with their beliefs, and how do we move them forward from there? I think one of the biggest difficulties would, and I'm just in being kind of on the sidelines to nutrition and sports performance is most athletes when they make it to like the world class level. They got there just by pure skill, right? Like, yeah. you know, what was the thing you sent me about DK Metcalf? Oh, yeah. Did you see this? The the thing that went out, it was an interview. I think he actually did it on I Am Athlete, if I'm yeah, not mistaken, on the I Am Athlete podcast. He talked about his nutritional protocol, and it was what? It's one cup of coffee, two bags. No, one cup of coffee, one meal a day, and as many bags of candy as he can eat. <laughs> and mind you, I did see that actually. I did see that. Yeah. Now he's talking and he starts bragging about which candies he buys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. Yeah. But like, do we look at that and just call bullshit? Do we call freak genetics? Do we call foul? Like, because my thing is when we, whenever I see nutritional interventions in athletes that you know are freaks, and don't get me wrong, DK Metcalf, regardless of what he's doing, is an absolute freak of nature. But one metric that is always held to nutritional interventions is body composition, mm -hmm. right? And I know like the old Tyson Fury thing of like, this is what peak performance looks like. It's like, is he an outlier? Or is that something that like, is that a barrier when you work with someone nutritionally? Like, hey man, I'm not shredded. Well, that's not the goal. Because a lot of people might not have an awareness around how they feel with training because it's always just been this skillful thing that they're just kind of good at. Yeah, in a lot of cases, an athlete is is the top of their game in spite of their nutrition practices, not because of their nutrition practices. You know, their their skill set, their genetics, and a whole bunch of factors come into play there. But just to extend on that, I, I've taken like professional, so our version of the NBA, which is called the NBL. Yeah. I've taken professional basketball teams to supermarkets and said, "All right, gents, go to your favorite food aisle. 
do you know how many went to the cereal aisle, the breakfast cereal aisle, or to the lolly aisle or the chocolate aisle? Only one guy happened to be a Canadian guy. Actually, he was an import. He actually went to um, he went to the the Whole Foods aisle where oats and you know wheat and quinoa and all that thing sold. Every single else, every single other person went to you know heavily processed sausages or the fucking cocoa pops or frosty fruits bloody aisle or whatever the case may be no one went to the fruit and veg aisle no one went to the to the meat of meat aisle so those things are one guy in particular was an american guy import as well bragged about going to mcdonald's for a bacon egg muffin every single morning before training because that was his fuel quote unquote I told you I so <laughs> little little things like that make a difference so you have to sort of go all right how am i going to create buying with this client to benefit their their performance not create their performance their, their performance already exists you're just trying to say listen hey there's another doorway that you haven't accessed yet there's a glass ceiling that exists that you need to open and say listen hey listen if you crack this glass ceiling you'll have 10 15 20 percent additional benefits what do you look for as a metric for them to to gauge if it's not the scale of the mirror right these things are all very objective i would imagine with these subtle interventions we're not going to see much of a, a tipping of the scales at a level of a professional basketball player. Like, what do you what do you tell them to anchor that that objective outcome to? Or at this point, it would probably be a subjective outcome to. Like, how do you create yeah. awareness around the improvements we're trying to make and that the nutritional intervention is quote unquote working? Well, some of them are some of them are, for example, objective. So you can do things like like court sprint speeds. You can do subjective things like 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 time to fatigue. You can do things like uh, vertical leaps in, in basketball players as well. But even in moving to other sports as well, just just relative you know weight on the bar, for example, is a big one as well. But the big one is movement speed, moving capacity, mm-hmm. sprint repeatability. You know, when it comes to basketball in particular, they're they're quite short durations. They're doing half court, full sprint sort of runs. They're doing shuttle runs as well. So all of those things, time to exhaustion, are a big one as well. Uh, Stuff in the gym, so they do cycle times, they do you know aerobic capacity testing. All of those things are, are objective measures, but subjectively, body composition. There's a huge. It works both ways. There's a huge misconception in in professional sports that they a should be shredded, or b don't need to be shredded. So that's how it sort of swings. Um, you know, Jordan, you and I both have both know a guy who who's desperate to be shredded, but doesn't need to be paid to be shredded. I love him. Love him to pieces. <laughs> so, so I mean, with that in mind, you know, that it's a conversation. Listen, you're not paid what you're paid to be shredded. You know, you're paid what you're paid to perform in a certain way. So coming to pair with that, you know, I'll, I'll reference because I think the easiest conversation of this is CrossFit is right. The sport breeds a certain body composition if fueled correctly. So that's one of the things you need to look at as well. And and is it is it going to be beneficial them for them to be leaner? Probably because they're doing so many body weight based movements that having additional body fat on them is going to be like carrying a weight vest at all times. It's going to be detrimental to their outcome. But then the, exce- the excessive portion of that is in endurance based sports, like a cyclist, for example, are you, are you eating into their performance in eating into their output by making them too lean? Mm-hmm. You know? So with, with cyclists, they're split up into, into sprinters, hill climbers and enduros. So the hill climbers will probably benefit from being a lighter body weight, but the sprinters not necessarily so. So how are they deciphered and how are they broken up into their spe- into the spe- specific field? One question I have, and I, it, I think it ties directly to this, is for me what I believe is a myth, and I'm really interested in your input, is the idea that weighing more makes you stronger. Like this is a powerlifting weight thing. Wait, who's like, weight, dog? It's like it's the thing. Like Wait. it's Wait, like powerlifters. Like, oh, you want to bench more? You gotta get heavier. Like you have to up your body weight. This is every light guy that yeah. does. And this is something that I I don't understand this because I was never heavy when I competed at power, powerlifting. I'm still not heavy now. I've never been at the top of any weight class I've competed at. So it's something that confuses me because I don't know what science, if any, there is around this idea. Besides it being a physics argument mm. of inertia. Yeah. So can you delve into this? I have an idea well, of what I think makes it beneficial, but I want to know your idea. It certainly changes levers, that's for sure. I mean, from a from a yeah. you know mm-hmm. from a physics point of view. But the reality is is no, just look at the look at the lineup of pro, of pro raw for the last four years. The the top guys are not they're not fat. The days of the fat. I think it was a, that's a that's an excuse that the nineteen eighties equipped powerlifters yeah. used to use. Um <laughs> The reality is it's, it's not the case anymore. I mean, Dan Green, look, the guy's a bloody unit. You know, yeah. 12 weeks would be on stage. 
Um, so I mean, no, I don't agree, I don't agree with that at all in the slice Killian. Yeah, and, absolutely not. And the only time I've ever seen a benefit to it or explained a benefit to somebody who's like really bought into that idea is I solely explain to them that dieting is stressful. So the idea that if you are in a caloric deficit, like that's just an added stress, like anything. Like you want to get stronger, don't drive to work, work from home. You'll probably get str stronger as well, right? Like stress is such an aggregate uh, stimulus that it's like, yeah, any one of these things would probably provide stress to an athlete. Being in a deficit is probably one of them would probably affect. But this goes back to a duration thing, right? Like, so powerlifters can, can compete well and truly into their forties without exactly. any real issue, right? Yeah. So if you have a person who is, let's hypothetically say 30 years of age and is larger than the average populace when it comes to body fat, you know, he's a just a fat fuck for example like if, if he if he has if he has weight to lose in the form of body yeah. fat and then you explain to him hey listen i can get you leaner and then fuel you adequately not not in a massive surplus just yeah. adequately we can make you equally as strong by the time you're 40 but a lot of them want the success now they want yeah. the power now they're not willing to have an off season of a slight deficit or they they don't you know understand that hey if you just don't progress this off season, we can have you healthier and therefore you could be lifting longer. You'll still be lifting at 42 and your knees won't give out walking up a flight of stairs because you're carrying an extra 40 kilos. Having that understanding is a big one. I mean, there's plenty of guys in, and for that matter, girls in powerlifting now who are within normal body weight range, which are lifting just absurd weights. Yeah, insane, way more than me. That's the other thing. Like I was just on a call with somebody from Belfast actually and it was trying to get through, and I think this is something like we've all been exposed to more now than ever in the last few months in the physique or the bodybuilding community is changing the criteria of success away from the specific criteria of success, like bodybuilders wanting to weigh the most or mm. add two kilos to the bar every week. I believe it's a, a, a 0.5 plates per side, I yes. believe is the common mm. nomenclature. Yeah. yeah, so adding like fractional plates to the bar in bodybuilding or stepping on the scale in bodybuilding at a heavier weight, but not looking in the mirror in bodybuilding. And this again is confusing to me where I would assume pr progress in, in physique is just measuring how big your arms are, not how much the scale weighs because there's a 120 kilo fat fuck and then there's a 120 kilo kuba you know what i mean so i think that's just yeah i think it becomes yeah. like in powerlifting it's you can keep getting heavier body weight and your bench will go up absolutely but relatively goes down well i'm curious yeah. just to see from like i think it's easy and almost i don't want to say excusable mm -hmm. to look at an athlete especially a more skill sport athlete football whatever yeah. and pardon their ignorance and it's easy to maybe highlight some of the pitfalls when dealing with athletes from a coaching perspective. What are, I'm interested in what are the common practices missed from a coaching perspective, yeah. right? Because I think it's, it's low hanging fruit to look at, you know, athletes and be like, look, man, you're a special teams NFL player. Why are you taking seven scoops of C4 in a game? <laughs> true story. God bless him. I know, right? I know that's yeah. a true story. But it's like, <laughs> You know, but, and that's, that's, you know, no fault on him. You know, if he's breaking the touchback record his first season, he's buying houses every other fucking day. It's like, cool, man. Like, yeah, maybe we don't do that. But what are the, what are the things that can honestly can be prevented from like a nutrition coaching perspective when it comes to, Hey, here's the things you need to consider when we're looking at coaching from a nutrition perspective, high performance athletes. Like what are the things that they commonly yeah. miss? Sticking with football in particular, it's not having one person look after ninety three people. That's probably the that's probably the first thing. You there. know, if you if you yeah. want to have a have an understanding, the same way you break down performance coaching in in, in and specifically this is for, in related to the football. If you have an offensive to coach and a defensive coach and a kicking coach or a special teams coach, the nutrition has to be tailored within a person who specialises in that area because football is such a, is a great example because it's such a diverse skill set in the sense that one person can't play another person's position in a lot of cases so with that in mind nutrition should be approached in the same way you have you know for example i don't touch fighters i don't i don't coach fighters because it's because weight cutting in for fighting is such a specific thing i've done two boxes in my entire career same thing if you're if you're working with 350 got 50 pound guys on their on their light day you know, conversing with them versus, you know, conversing with a running back is going to be a different conversation or, for example, a, a, a special teams player. So breaking that up, maybe have one head nutritionist for the team and then have a, a people you can actually work underneath them as well. But also understanding fuel usage. If, if, if a person is during, especially during a season when the people live locally, maybe provide, I mean, the food at, at, in a lot of 
NFL teams is just exponentially good, like the availability of the food, but maybe control it better. All right. You know, what, what's four sources of breakfast, not 10 sources of breakfast. Don't range from sugar laden cereals to oats. Maybe control that better. Maybe look at, all right, how do we actually how do we fuel these people for whatever event is coming up next? So in the morning, for example, if they're on the field by 8 a.m., maybe have them there at 6.30 fueling adequately, not there at quarter to eight or at 7.30 trying to get bagels and jam down their throat, you know, things like that. So you control their timing better and you'll see massive changes both on and off the field as well. In the pre-game situation, when they get paid to train, they get paid to play, right? So have them rock up to wherever they're supposed to be and actually fuel themselves as a team. So it becomes uniform and a person gets a handout, right? You know, this is yours, this is yours, and this is yours. But the page isn't a cut and copy, paste and paste and cut. So cut and paste option. It's actually, all right, this is player A, this is what you're going to consume. This is player B, this is what you're going to consume. And you need X requirements for these things. Yeah, I would say the extra hands thing, because like we see it in the, you know, in the pro weight room, having like a lot of assistants or like in college settings, having GAs to what load the bar. If there's one thing that doesn't necessarily correlate to performance, it's technique and execution of movements in the gym. Frankly, like if I'm to allocate a budget and staff, knowing what I know now, it's like, all right, sure. Someone, I would much rather have a generic strength training program that covers 55 active roster guys and a completely tailored nutrition program for okay. every player. I think that would yield way better dividends because like ultimately the the maximum amount of stress, especially in season, is going to be the Thursday night or the Sunday night or the Monday night, whenever they yeah. decide to play or whenever their schedule dictates they play. So I think that mm -hmm. you know, the personalization of nutrition far exceeds a return on investment than the personalization of exercise selection. Now, mind you, like, you know, there's there's edge cases where ACL or and that's you know that's not a, uh, that's not a uh, insignificant number of players. There are a lot of players in the league that have these you know these these injuries that necessitate a more tailored approach. But broadly speaking, I would say because you're looking at five different sports being played on the same field, sticking with football, five different you know d uh, fluctuations within energy systems, you know duration of, of actual intensity during a play. Average play in the NFL is 5.6 seconds, right? Yeah. So it's like, how do we fuel for that 5.6 seconds when you have these different players doing different things for repetitive bouts of that 5.6 seconds? So it's that's definitely something that I see, you know, uh, that's over that's overshot. I think they're kind of getting smart with the rest of it. Like they're doubling down on like recovery budgets from, frankly, our jackasses like us. Chiropractors are getting in there. Physical therapists are getting in there. Chiro chambers, saunas, all that. But they're missing, I think, that low hanging fruit, like allocating, you know, another hundred grand a year for a couple of nutritionists to come in part time and, and and really curtail. I know one team, was it the Dallas Mavericks that had a juice budget? A, ju a juice budget. And I think it was the Mavericks. I think I was told this this may have been a, a Schles bomb that he dropped on me that they go in and do blood work and then they they formulate special like celery and you just, I can hear Phil is going, no, they didn't. Please don't tell me they did this. Like, oh, you're low, low in vitamin E? Well, you're drinking carrot juice, Dirk Nowitzki. Like not asking the question as to like why you're low in vitamin E and thinking of almost like the nutritional tensegrity that would lead to that. But mm. dead set, they would have their own little like, some, like what's yours? Like mine's carrot, mango, apple. It's like, what's yours? Like mine's lychee and, and wheatgrass. And they just did blood work. Someone just came in and was like, oh, yeah, yeah, this is our business. What do you think? Like, I think it's fucking brilliant. Imagine wasting blood work on juice. Like, well, imagine wasting know. money, right? Like, this is, it was a big spend. Jeez. There, there are plenty of teams that actually do use juice bars. I, I know one team, for example, that uses an external juice company that comes in and they and they bring their little trays of juice. And I think out of the, I checked the menu and it was, I don't know, I can't remember what, what what the company's called, but it was some of them had 115, 116 grams of sugar per per large serving Fire per um, per fifteen yeah. or sixteen ounce tub, and like that's that's a, a crazy amount. And the the thing is, like the person I was working with, I actually asked them. I jumped on the on the website of the company and actually said, "Listen, can you go and request this particular juice because it's a better option for these reasons? It's got a better blend of fruits and vegetables in it." And and he did, and they were okay with it. But that wasn't being supplied. They they'd obviously, I'm assuming, the company had offered 
the cheapest juices to make and they were bringing the six different versions and the players didn't really get a pick it was walked up and they just grabbed them off the table and they and they walked away that's very generic that's very unregulated and to go on going back onto the specificity of nutrition you know as you just said the four or five games on the on the same field it goes back to Killian's point, right? So if you have a nutritionist who's working with uh, the larger guys, you can control, you know, things like protein accretion. You can control things like fuel availability. You can, you can say, listen, this person is getting a little bit heavy and they're becoming a little bit slower. Does player B need to be on a little bit of a diet? And then going back to Jordan, to your point, when it comes to recovery, we can go, all right, we can have one either head nutritionist or sub nutritionist who specializes in recovery, for example. So does this person twinge something? Have they got some tendon ligament issues? Do we need to bring in some things like collagen with vitamin C for absorption? Having these conversations with the players on a much more specific need. And look, the juice conversation is tongue in cheek when it comes to like blood testing. That's fucking retarded to be honest. But like that's a different thing. Like, you know, just ensuring that the person has a higher level of, of micronutrient intake and understanding where the demands are. Do these people require more iron? Is there a vegetarian base in the, you know, in, in the team or a, a person not necessarily who's, who's vegetarian, but maybe what I call plant based, which just means the majority of their food comes from plants, but they may still, in, you know, indulge in some meats. And people sort of scoff at that, especially in the strength capacity world. But the reality is that exists and it's becoming more and more prominent. You know, while vegetarianism is going down globally, it's actually going up in the Western world. And the only reason why it's going down globally is because India and China are getting more money, which means they're actually consuming more meat. And there's so many of them, you know, from a global perspective, meat consumption is going up, but Western wise, it's going down. So how, understanding that between your players, I know of a couple of players that actually tried to go vegan or at least vegetarian coming into a season, which is like, don't change shit when you're about yeah. to get $12 million on the line. Mm. <laughs> Cam Newton did that. Yeah, Cam Newton was famous for that, and he was. And again, we talk about like the genetic factor. He's like, "Look, dude, if I eat a ribeye, I'm 280." He's like, "I can't be 280 behind center." He's like, "I gotta sit around and eat fucking root vegetables like a, like a, like a bikini prep chick just to be 250." And it's like, okay, like understand that genetic potential and understand like, yeah, he can't be that big, and and whether or not that's you know all that's going on, but you know, he you saw, I think you saw in that case his nutrition be very poorly managed and i would argue that that's probably why you saw him take some time off from the league was you're, you're not going to be able to perform man no like if you're going to make that drastic a change to something especially at that level and i think a cognitive perspective too would have a huge impact like switching over to you know from one source to another let alone on like the recovery side but the actual like neurotransmitter state of acuity and readiness for a quarterback like, you know, if you're sitting there with a cloud over your head or a cloud in your head, mm -hmm. good mm -hmm. luck, man. I think that's something that often gets overlooked, right? We see it at a very small scale in the fitness space with the if it fits your macros yeah. crowd, right? Not thinking about mm -hmm. micros eating Pop-Tarts before they train. But it's like, you know, I would say that obviously it's going to have a bigger ramifications at a larger scale with more money involved. But people don't think of the, you know, the the cognitive aspect of like, hey, how it is, how do you, how do you feel? Because that, that, I'm assuming that would just be a balance of neurotransmitters, which are broadly dictated by what you put in your face. Yeah, but also going back to the whole like fiber concentration, right? The the, pro the, the problem with plant based proteins is they're generally attached to carbohydrates and or fats. So you've got a person who is opting for say legumes, for example. Yeah, there's protein in legumes. No one can, no one can sort of you know, go against that or argue that. But the reality is it's, it's also bound to three times as many carbohydrates and, a, you know, 15 grams of fiber per, per 100 grams. So with that in mind, this individual is going on the pitch going, oh, yeah, I'm adequately fueled. I just can't access the fuel for three to six hours because it's still digesting in my gut. Yeah. You know, because they've, they've chosen to use carbohydrates, which which aren't fast releasing. They're, they're a slow churn or slow release. Their they're gastric, they're gastric uh, emptying is just exponentially slower than that of say white rice or bagels or honey um what do you, what do you guys call them honey stingers yeah no, no we, we, do, we don't call them that um <laughs> did you or, hear him go over the australian grocery list of like bibbity bops and hobbity hoops yeah. and stuff i was like what <laughs> <laughs> i knew what none of those what things were <laughs> but, but also like on, on 
on another note as well, you know, maybe just don't eat ribeyes, which are 14% fat, you know, maybe eat chicken breast instead, Ken, I and you be good. Well, this was like, this is a big thing <laughs> so I realized <laughs> when trying to gain weight. Like, I think that's where, like, I think the conversation is kind of funny, but in me trying to be bigger, we have photos. We just oh, talked about God, You were so fucking small. Of me two years ago. I was like a Jewish mother. Like, he was like, oh, you skin and bone. Come here. The first meal we ever had yeah. was in Mississauga, and yeah. I made you a ribeye, and it was just, you kind of looked at me, it was just a ribeye at a plate with salt and you're like is this, this is it and i was like yeah dude it's gonna be this ground beef white rice and cholula sauce yeah for as long as you know me and we did god for so you were long. fucking tiny and i remember like gaining weight and then like hitting a plateau where i was talking to cody here yeah and we i was training with cody one day we were training legs and i was like man like how do i gain more weight i went from like 72 kilos as phil likes to trash uh yeah. no one's 72 kilos it was me i was, <laughs> was to like 79 kilos and then it was like 81 i was like man i'm just, i just can't gain weight and he kind of brought up the point that, that you brought up phil but in a different way he was just saying like stop eating fatty ready like fatty red meat he was like mm. the the caloric density of that meal is so high he's like there's no way you're going to be able to eat like more food volume um mm. so i switched to like what you said i switched you know not to chicken breast but chicken thighs at least and it's like yeah. oh the the amount of protein i can consume maybe not in one sitting but over the course of the duration of a day, it was exponentially higher. Yeah. When I was eating a ribeye and a Japanese sweet potato, shout out Don Saladino, Beautiful. every so day. Good. That was my one meal a day. That's yeah. what I would eat. And I just fucked That's off. That's exactly it's like why training I eat that, Because I don't yeah. eat throughout the day. Yeah. Yeah. It's a calorie-dense meal. Well, I exactly. look at it like training frequency, right? Where it's like if I train arms once a week and I just fuck my <laughs> yeah. entire arm, yeah. it's like, yeah, I can't touch it again for seven days. But if I train... You know, if I train seven, arm times seven times a week, I have to augment for, you know, volume per bout in a day. And I end up with, you know, a, a, a much broader, uh, a, a lot more volume accumulated over the course of a week. Right. So it's the same sort of principle of like, hey, you want to gain weight, you want to get bigger. It's like, well, have a workable training frequency with more effective reps, have a workable uh, feeding window with more effective calories. Yeah. And I think those two go hand yeah. in hand. Because I yeah, won't tell you what I eat now, but... Well, Killian, don't feel bad. When I asked, when I, when I, when I told Jordan to put spinach in the spaghetti sauce, yes. it looked like I asked just asked him to bloody decode a nuclear bomb. He was like, "What are you talking about?" So mad, <laughs> it's so mad. It's fucking land seaweed. It's the most disgusting. You're pulling it out of your teeth. It's just. It's so just... I've been eating a large pizza every day when I leave the gym here, and that's all I eat. Peak performance. He's our Tyson Fury. Uh, and I've dropped seven kilos in uh, twelve days. The pizza diet. Just eating a large a pizza, pizza and a and a liter of a liter of Perrier. That's God. my new thing. So don't the, do the that. The reality is, from a from a from a beneficial sort of concept of, of nutrition and beneficial concept of, of protein accretion is is you want to hit at least three times a day. So you want to hit protein at least three times a day. Now you need to choose something. So Killian, to, to go on your your point, I, I generally recommend chicken thigh too, and the reason why is because one, they taste better than chicken so breast. Good. Two, well, they also the also thing is also they're more forgiving than chicken breast too. So you can you can walk away from the fry pan, come back, or walk yeah. away from the air fryer and come back, and you go, oh shit, it was there for an extra five minutes. Oh. It's okay, it's still tolerable. Whereas chicken breast just goes in the bin in my household, um, yeah. you know. So like if you overcook it, so those things. But three times a day, so you got to you got to pick pick your battle. So what can you tolerate in three a minimum of three feedings per day? So you know, obviously, if it's going to be whole food options, chicken thighs is easy, white rice is easier. Um, whereas things like the higher fiber content may create some sort of you know delay in 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 uptake or, or delay in sort of like repercussions of hunger so you might go all right meal one will be whole food orientated meal two could be some sort of liquid nutrition or liquid nutrition blend for example so say fruit greek yogurt and a protein shake and a protein powder sorry mixed together and then meal three could be whole food again if, if that's where you need to tick boxes especially going back to that phase one principle yeah. if a person needs to work on these things all right how do we do it in a way that's going to make this easy for them and then move them forward as a whole and if that means three feedings or in, I, I personally prefer four feedings but let's stick with the the ballpark figure of three feedings it's all right how do we get maximum amount of nutrition in with minimal amount of volume and we do that through but through hand picking and going back on the comment about spinach i like spinach because when you heat it it just whittles shrinks. It, just, it just it shrinks right but what i don't like about spinach is is the taste the it gurus sucks. well the gurus online tend to sort of claim all these health benefits the problem with with, with vegetables is 
it's not the serving size, it's the portion size. So when you claim spinach is high fiber, for example, right? That's great per 100 grams. When was the last time you had 100 grams of spinach? It's a lot of spinach. It's a lot of spinach, right? So you have to think, all right, so what are the benefits of these particular foods based on the portion in which I'm going to consume, not the serving which is suggested, you know, on Google? There's like also like, I don't know what it what you would use as a smart word for it, but like some micronutrients are only available like in certain states, right? Like if something is cooked or if something is raw, like I, I assume there's a different bioavailability to your ability to actually utilize what's in it. Yeah, That's vitamin right. C is the big one you got to really, really sort of be conscious of. Vitamin C, it, den- it, it just damages itself when it cooks. So, so sticking with the spinach thing, if you do, for example, cook your spinach, you need to, and, and you're not a mil- you're not a milk eater, you're, you're a non-dairy person, for example, which is ridiculous in its own right. But if you are a non-dairy person, you sort of need to go, all right, how do we pick that back up again? We need to look at vitamin C from other places. So if you're having spinach, have some strawberries. So I do like Things cookies like and milk. So I'm interested in the dairy. <laughs> Let's go down the dairy route. Why is it good to have dairy? Or why is it at least not bad? Yeah, that's what I'm. Like, I'm, what is I'm, the on, de- I'm what is on team the, Phil it here. Seems it's like hinted dairy, towards yeah. it's bad to not have. Dairy, yeah, exactly. So right? what's the benefits of dairy? Like I'm, I want to know. I'm about so it. Dairy, dairy reduces risk of Alzheimer's. Reduces it reduces the risk of colorectal cancers. It actually has been shown to be uh, associated that. with better body composition. It's a high source of protein. It actually helps to rehydrate you faster than water does. It has a naturally high sodium concentration to it. Um, it actually allows if you do it in flavored form, it's actually a better a better recovery aspect than whey protein is from a, from a recovery point of view, not from a muscle synthesis point of view. The different conversations, um, and it also it's easy to consume. Okay, and it depends on what yeah. you what your and ethnicity is but approximately 74 percent of people across the world are actually have some sort of intolerance to dairy but it's a spectrum right it's a standard deviation yeah. curve so you can people who have massive intolerances people who, who have to have quote-unquote intolerance but they don't actually notice from a physiological point of view so these things also 83 percent of all, of all studies on dairies including meta-analyses have shown that dairy is anti-inflammatory not pro-inflammatory like the gurus will tell you online so it actually benefits you it actually helps to minimize things like inflammatory cytokines in the body as well so all of these things are beneficial for dairy. So people who tell you that dairy is bad for you, are f- they're wrong. Let's just leave it there. <laughs> Dad said I'm getting, we're getting milk tonight. That's great because yeah. I drink a, I drink a milk. lot of milk. I drink like six yeah, so liters Lundy of milk Lundy just a told week. me this is how he got so big. It's chugging so, bags of milk. Bags of milk. Yeah, well, Welcome to Canada, dog. So the the go, you know the old go mad diet right so a gallon of milk a day yeah that's that's a different conversation so when I'm referencing these things and actually cool thing about the about the uh, Alzheimer's reduction it goes on per serving so that's one serving we see a twelve percent reduction at I think it's two servings a day of dairy you see an eighteen percent reduction in risk of Alzheimer's disease the only thing that is actually this that, that goes against dairy's benefits is Parkinson's there's a slight increased risk of Parkinson's disease when it comes to dairy consumption but it's correlative not causative so they're not quite sure if it if it's locked in yet and there there's a lot of a lot of the do-gooders online who are anti-dairy will tell you things like the saturated fat in dairy promotes all these bad heart things well no that's saturated fat saturated yeah. fat promotes those bad heart things when actual fact dairy it has saturated fat in it too but a, a simple change to skim milk or low fat milk is going to going to sort of negate those facts and really even more importantly on that some of the latest research on dairy is sort of saying that there's there's enzymes in dairy and i can't remember what the enzymes called that actually goes against the da- the dangers of saturated fat. So the actual saturated fat correlated with dairy doesn't actually cause the negative effects of saturated fat globally, which is actually pretty cool. So it just internally nullifies the saturated fat that carries with yeah. it by another enzyme. By another enzyme. So yeah, so this is... And I think a lot of it has to do with the with the other benefits. So it's, it's a shit flows downhill sort of conversation, right? So there's so many benefits that exist from dairy that some of the detriments, for example, like the Parkinson's and like the saturated fat, they don't outweigh the myriad of benefits that come from it. Okay, but the big one for me is is the recovery aspect of it and usability. And I mentioned I'll, I will expand on this. I mentioned before about the hydration principles, and I saw some of you guys sort of raise an eyebrow because it's an odd thing to say. Um, from a chemical point of view, from a, from a constituent point of view, think about what milk is. Milk is saturated water in a sense, right? It's nutrient saturated water. 
so because it has a sodium concentration, it has a carbohydrate concentration, it has a protein concentration, it, it, it slows the gastric emptying and that slows the way it actually it passes through the abdominal wall. And that actually allows the water to, to trickle through at a more consistent pace, which means it doesn't rush the osmolality of the blood or the, or the solute concentration of the blood, which means we get a more consistent concentration of fluid coming into the body. And therefore, we actually get a better uptake and we retain more of the fluid. We don't, we don't just piss it out because when you guzzle water, when you're in a dehydrated state you actually end up more dehydrated than if you were to do it in a slower state uh today's episode was brought to you by dairy farmers of ontario yeah. dude what a milk. plug unbelievable yeah. milk mvp it, it sounds like doesn't it? you know it's hilarious is i'm actually allergic to dairy so <laughs> yo can you give like a cole's notes of the cultural thing because you you uh, you alluded to the fact yeah. that it's like it could be you know percentage or your likelihood of tolerance would be based oh, yeah, off yeah, of race yeah. so so yeah, so the the people who can tolerate the dairy the most are Nordic people. Yo, let's so, go, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> they tend to have a about I believe ninety. I, I want to say ninety one percent, but I could be off by a few percent there. About ninety one percent tolerance of dairy. The the people who have the least tolerance are actually Middle Eastern and then Africans. So is it proximity to the equator? That's what it sounds like to me. It sounds like proximity uh, to cows. <laughs> no. Yeah, it actually is, it? is the proximity to cows. It it's, is proximity, it's proximity to to, yeah? to the reliance on dairy About, as an agricultural okay. aspect. Well, yeah. well done. It yeah. makes sense though, because like, if you think of like formal agriculture, places like Nordic places, India, North America, all those places mm. would have had former formal and like long-term agricultural sources where they could have cows and pasture and be able to farm them places like africa or the middle east have a lesser reliance on farming of cows or it's not a ready supplement uh, it's like genetically not long-term something they would have adapted to i would believe yeah it's quite it's quite astounding so i think i'm once again i'm i'm, I'm gonna I'm, I'm approximating the figures here but i'm pretty sure middle eastern populations are up to 64 or 65 percent intolerant yeah. to lactose and i believe africa you know, is even higher right is africa number one uh, no i think middle east is number one okay. i could be wrong to be honest it, it could be it could be africa then middle east it could be middle east then africa uh, i don't please don't quote yeah, me that no, but it, it's high in those two regions though it's high in those two regions but also as well think about the to extend on that we have to remember with with so lactose is, is the sugar that exists it's a disaccharide that exists in dairy it's broken down by the lactase enzyme, right? So we have a whole bunch of disaccharides, disaccharides that actually break down our, our, our disaccharides. So um, lactose is the one that exists in milk. We don't just do that wholly and solely ourselves. So even, this is what I talked before about 74% of people have an issue with dairy. You may not notice it because your consumption of certain bacteria may actually negate the feeling that you may get right so we have things like like bifidus lactum lactobacillus they themselves actually generate their own lactase in order to fuel themselves from the sugar that you consume via the way of lactose so although your body may not produce lactase in any great form or great amount the the bacteria in your gut may actually look after it for you so this is where that trade-off exists so going back to those populations middle east and african populations they may not have a high availability of those particular bacteria so so that actually allow those phyla issues they think, think they're gram positive so they actually may be sort of things to consider there as well could it have to do with like heat or pasteurization like it's cold in nordic countries it's hot in africa and the middle east or like the pasteurization of milk homogenized versus non homogenized I don't know. I'm just, I, I don't know if you know any more about this, but this is interesting. That I don't know, to be honest, to be honest, but definitely pasteurization would have an effect on it. Absolutely. Yeah. Cause obviously you're pasteurizing the, you know, the quote unquote bad bacteria out of the milk, but you know, that's, that's up for a discussion as well about whether or not sort of, you know, un unprocessed milk is better or worse for you. Well, I feel this truth of like regional foods in general. Yeah. Like I, the closest I think I've ever come to death was, uh, eating kimchi based off of some recommendation. I was in California. Obviously, I was in California because where the fuck? Kimchi almost killed you? Dude, where I come from, they haven't seen people that eat kimchi in a very long time, if ever. So and maybe it was just like there was food poisoning in the kimchi. <laughs> but I swear to God, it was like my people have never consumed this. No one in Newfoundland has ever eaten kimchi before. And I ate it. And dude, I was on the toilet for like three fucking days. Well, we also went for Ethiopian. 
And you found that excessively spicy. Dude, I was fucked. Are you kidding me? The back of my <laughs> eyeballs were sweating. It was insane. <laughs> But it's just like I think it's no different than anything else. Like it's a tolerance Explosion. thing. Yeah, like you are your what IgM and IgE mediated responses that trigger with allergies, right? It's basically your immune system, your immunoglobin system. If I have a certain genetic predisposition to have IgE and Ig, oh, fuck, I'm I'm forgetting all of them. There's like four IgG of them. IgG is another one. IgG. IgG is delayed response. IgA, IgE, and IgM. Yeah. This is why Phil's here. Uh, <laughs> but it's like I, uh, there's a pre code for that, right? That we're assuming is genetic, and it's it's malleable, right? Like I was allergic to my cat when we took it in from the street, and now it could like sleep on my head, and I don't have any problems with it. But it's just it's that exposure thing, right? It's like you. Yeah, I was exposure getting, therapy is a real thing, though. Yeah. yeah oh, exposure dude, I was having like hit like the what, what I'm assuming would be like this histamine cascade, and I was fucking sneezing my head off like I was cats going back in the goddamn parking garage where I am, and then I literally woke up one morning and it was just like, oh, I can breathe through my nose for the first time in four weeks. But it's just I just like, want to be in the circle of people who talked around saying, hey, let's have Ethiopian for lunch. Like, where did that come up? That okay. was Killian. <laughs> Killian is <laughs> Ethiopian's so good. Don't, it's great, the, right? Energia? Is that what? Or it, endura? 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 Endura is like, oh, yeah, the, the bread. Like. Yeah, I know he, thing over here. No, I know yeah. he looks like he works at the docks, but uh, my man's my man's cultured. Always trying new things. Um, yeah. Oh, so this is like this all kind of like this whole conversation brings up probably the last interesting question I have to myself, which is. A lot of people, I, I'm going to call them gurus, hopefully you agree, Phil, preach like food variability. Like don't eat the same thing for too long because the devil comes for you when you sleep or something. But I've always found a better, I, I subjectively feel better from eating like foods all the time. Like if I eat ground beef and rice at the beginning, I was like, all right. But like mm -hmm. the more I ate ground beef and rice, I like felt actually better. And the switching of moods made me, switching of foods made me feel worse. Like I found like I started to digest the food better, same amount of calories, exact same distribution of food sources. Uh, the more I keep it like I felt better, that's subjective. And I know, you know, I am obsessive. So maybe it was just in my head, but can you go into that? So part of the reason you felt better is because you ate uniformly. And if you, if you veered off that path, you would get some sort of negative response. Yeah. Okay. okay? If you have a cat and a dog and you only feed the dog, what happens to the cat? It dies. It does, all right? So if you have five five main phyla in your guts of bacteria and then you only feed three food that actually associates with three of them, you're going to kill the other two off. So you're oh. eating the same thing all the time. So if I if I bring in a Nepalese and mullein from something you never touched before and I bring it in, Killian's going to feel like a bag of shit because he hasn't been exposed to that fiber before, right? Oh. So having having food exposure is one of the key things. And, and they've associated this with 30, 30 sources per day. In the last episode I did with you guys, I walked through the train analogy, right? Yeah walking through and rotating through that's the same conversation so <laughs> so having that exposure and just changing two or three things weekly um is going to allow you to be exposed to things like beta glucans and hemicellulose and cellulose and all the different fiber types but also it also allows for a better nutrient delivery across the board as well we, we know that the colors of food are associated with different phytonutrients and phytochemicals whether it be anthocyanins or you know um, different sort of like um, beta um, beta carotins and things or like carotenoids as they're called so that's going to allow bad benefits towards our health as well so you know that's a big factor too but also to go on your extended point on you know why you felt better maybe you can be able to control your hunger better with with those sort of systematic foods is because we know that when you start to regulate your hunger intake or regulate your food sources your body actually starts to down regulate the hunger response because you'll get you're getting in the same thing all the time so the hedonistic properties of that food starts to decline mm -hmm. so you feel it much easier to control so if a person's going into a really heavy diet period so so for example like coming onto a stage preparation or they need to be excessively lean for a short window of time maybe a model shoot will actually start to regiment their food in a much more sequential form and not rotate a lot because the rotation can create the hedonistic principle and actually want to eat more things all the time. It's the pizza once a day. You Getting excessively it. lean. I yeah. feel great. You nailed it. Stage <laughs> ready, dog. Yeah. Stage no, ready. That's really interesting. I've always had that question. Yeah. Well, dude, no? Phil Smith, appreciate it, man. 
This Honestly, awesome. yeah, this you, like you never break stride. This is the, the most informed where we yeah. just like, all right, but let's just sit down. I, get I, I like the positioning of him in the studio. Yeah. Like, I feel like we're just, we're sitting at like the pulpit and he's just up there like all. He's very he's, much the authority all, here. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, and, well, to be fair, at 140 kilos, you're he's kind of the authority, authority <laughs> wherever the fuck you go. Yeah, that's very true. Of all like, because we get varying responses of like, oh, you were bigger in person. Or smaller, but we just had a weekend intensive, so people have met us in person for the first time. Um, I can't imagine everyone's ever met Phil and gone, ah, you're a lot smaller than I thought. Abnormally large, both in presence and presence. Yeah. I think that when I see photos of myself, I think, geez, a bit of a contrast there. Dude, you see you, have you seen yourself <laughs> next to mortals? Yeah, you're a big yeah, dude. Yeah. Well, hey, man. Again, I we're gonna make this a routine thing. Oh, for you sure. continually yeah. are the most requested guest, regardless of how many knowledge bombs. And I don't necessarily like the term, but your ability to just go like just without blinking or breaking stride and doing like these seventeen syllable things and allowing three. Uh, let's just say less than informed on the nutritional side. <laughs> Me, my friend Captain Ribeye, and Doctor Delicio over here. <laughs> but it's like. To have like the go f deep on the technical stuff and yeah. bring it into the tactical world. We appreciate you uh, always lending us your time and lending us your wisdom, man. I'm really looking forward uh, to, to what's to come. So, again, I appreciate your time, man, and we'll, uh, we'll have you back on real soon. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, Phil. Thank you, gents. Appreciate it.